Here is Jonathan to tell us more about his latest work in Ukraine alongside Zach Seward from Coindesk. Thanks to you both. Hey, everybody. Long time. Good to be up here again. Jonathan, hello. hello. You are a man of many talents, first of all. What's your deal? What's the secret? Tell me about yourself and all the things that you do. Um, I think I'm easily uh, distractible, probably. <laughs> um, you know, I, I came to the Web3 world having worked in technology first as an engineer, and then in international human rights law, and then finally um, in film and television. And I'm kind of a mutt because I've basically all these three things, no matter what I do, I always end up doing them. And I think it just comes with doing what I love. I guess the question is then, you know, war crimes in Ukraine is a bit heavier than Silicon Valley, right? Yeah. So what, what drew you to that subject matter? Obviously, it's a very important thing. I want to hear more about the vision of it. But talk to me about why you felt that was what you want to direct your energies toward. Well, there was this crazy compression algorithm that... <laughs> um, you know, I, I think it's... In a conference like this, I think it's easy to get really excited about the opportunities with blockchain technologies. And I know that there is, we're in this incredible moment of expansion of the entire sector. And then with the crypto winter, I think we're all starting to learn about who's gonna actually stick around, who actually cares about this technology. And when I get to the core of something like an immutable record, what we are now storing in Ukraine, which I'm happy to talk about today is um, it's critical. And the reason why is because the internet itself is changing before our eyes. As Russia now starts to disengage from the international system, forcibly and also voluntarily, there is a really big structural thing happening with the internet because US companies are now starting to abandon their internet operations. All of the internet infrastructure for Russia is now transforming. They have already done drills for years preparing for this moment to disengage from the internet backbone. So that means that the, let's call it the authoritarian web, which was kind of pioneered by China, is now got a huge new player. So why does this stuff matter? It's because we are building this foundation that's from the ground up, a chance to provide a future for an internet that can be resilient, censorship resistant, and doesn't allow state actors, no matter what they choose to do, to limit content. Those are the table stakes. Um, and I think that Ukraine is, is um, sadly a, a very potent example of what's to come. Yeah, I think, you know, even to, uh, you know, heighten those stakes even more, right? We're talking about a system that is rooted in fact, right? The legal system is predicated on a shared set of established fact. And I think what we see sort of in this era of the internet is a significant uh, undermining of that reality, right? People can determine their own set of facts. So I can understand why trying to establish a permanent record of observable events is something that is very important for this next era of the internet. And I'd just be curious to further extrapolate to that sort of factiness that is inherent to what you're trying to do. Yeah, so it's, let's, let's start with just, let's talk a little bit about the realities of what's going on on the ground. We're at a moment where Ukraine is a, is a pivotal case for everyone because you have something miraculous that's going on. There actually is a functioning government in Ukraine. Against all odds, you have law and order as best as they can establish it that is continuing. So that means that there are active war crimes prosecutions that are being undertaken by domestic prosecutors. You also have international prosecutors over at the ICC, and then also the potential of creating a dedicated tribunal to cover um, basically long-term accountability. And so into that process now, at those three levels, you have thousands and thousands of records that are being submitted every hour with smartphones documenting what are apparent war crimes. The mountain of this evidence is unprecedented because obviously the connectivity in Ukraine and you know, the availability of, of smartphones makes this possible. 
So the question is, for these three types of accountability mechanisms, how are they going to deal with all of this data? And that's not a simple task at all. And so we are, with the last couple of weeks, we've been working on trying to architect solutions that can help each one of those do exactly what you said, which is maintain the rule of law. Um, what I think is really important, and, and I think the audiences here should really recognize, is that um, you all can play a part in this. Um, there is an immediate opportunity for you to engage. We have, and I'd be very happy to talk to you, specific dossiers which are now ready. So if you're a storage provider, we'd like to store it with you. And we'd like to think about ways in which we can keep this evidence resilient because what we're talking about in terms of um, authentic, um, accountability, this is not something that's going to happen overnight. You should expect about a two decade long process to try to bring people to account. Yeah, we saw this with the Balkan conflict. I mean, those things played out decades after those incidents occurred. Talk to me about just, you know, at a personal level, how this came to be, right? You know, we have a high stakes problem, a potential solution. How did you personally get involved in this? And walk me through that side of this story. Well, I mean, it was a, it was a pretty simple conversation. Um, I was talking to Dan Bonet and Saki Weissman, who were two close friends, noted Stanford professors, and we were, it was, October of 2018, and if we can go back to that moment, um, it was really um, the beginning of a crypto winter at that point. And as Dan likes to say, a lot of the tourists were starting to leave. And Dan and, and Saki and I started to think about what would be an iconic use case of using blockchain technologies. And what we thought about was we said, well, could we take a very valuable and vulnerable data set, for instance, 55,000 testimonies of the survivors of genocide, which is about four petabytes worth of data, and could we put that on something like a distributed network like IPFS? And at that point, Falcon was in testnet. And that was really what sparked all of this. It was just a simple observation that this type of data is better stored on a decentralized network because it'd be more resilient, you'd have more opportunities to preserve this information, and so that led to basically 10 more questions and 10 more and 10 more. And here we are four years later almost uh, with an entire lab, a whole set of infrastructure that we've built. Um, and I think it's just a good reminder that you know, at that point, the naysayers had really stepped up and said, that's it, it's over. This thing called Ethereum is dead. Sounds familiar, We're kind right? of hearing a little bit of that now, you know? And, and, and that I think is, what the question is, was that necessarily that moment, what was unique about it and I think that all of us need to recognize that if you're in this for the long haul, it is a multi-year, multi-decade process of really getting this accomplishment of creating a decentralized web. Um, and so even when the going gets tough, like that's actually when arguably you've got your best opportunities. So the current project is a weighty one, but you mentioned sort of multi-year, multi-decade. As it relates to the lab, do you guys have a sense, a hunch, as to what those next two, three, four projects will be over time, or is it just something that emerges as we've seen with this crisis? Yeah, so for, for those people who don't know, the lab has um, three areas of practice, so history, law, and journalism. In each of those, we have fellows, and we have a variety of programs to really get people that are stakeholders in human rights a chance to experiment with this technology, give us feedback, and create really a closed loop of how to develop a set of best practices on how to use the technology. And you know, cryptography is a, is a very powerful uh, set of tools. And, and what we want to do is make sure that we use this in the right way. It, I think that involves really an important recognition that we're probably going to get things wrong. That this, given things are so high stakes, the technology is experimental, what it means is that as a community, we need to recognize that we have to constantly be evaluating and checking ourselves what are our ethics, what are our values, and what are our goals. Because if you get carried away and get kind of maximalist about decentralization is the solution to everything, or that you know, distributed ledgers are immutable and therefore you know, gonna save the world, 
um, you're setting yourself for actually a world of problems, not just in terms of financial disappointment, which I think what most people are worried about. It actually hurts the overall mission because what we really want to see is a reasonable and vibrant alternative to Web2, right? And so that means that a lot of the problems that we know from Web2, they're just not going to go away because you have a blockchain or because you get a lot of funding. Um, those problems are going to persist, and so we need to be extra vigilant that we don't repeat the same mistakes again. So that's why we created the lab. Got it. So you're a cross-disciplinary guy, and you're going out into a cross-disciplinary world and getting feedback. Is there any feedback that was especially striking, painful, eye-opening to you as you set the foundations for what the lab could and could not accomplish? Wow, that's a good question. Um, You know, I think the biggest question that it is, and there's some people in this audience I know who are working on this, is the question around identity and encryption itself of, of that identity. Um, these are not solved problems whatsoever. And I just want to give you an understanding of like why this is so difficult for us, which is that when you take vulnerable data and you chop it up into small pieces and then spread it out as far as wide as you can, the good thing about that is that it's resilient and it's trustless and all the fun stuff that we know about, about these solutions. But here's the problem. There is no access control. So what that means is that the information is out there and if you have the key to unlock that information, that means that you have access. There's nothing really we can do to stop it because in theory the whole idea is that you want the data to be in as many places as you want. So identity, password protections, you know, key management, all those types of things. What we found kind of belatedly, I guess, is that uh, those are actually the very first things that people in the human rights space want to know about. And then here's the second part, which is the most frustrating and vexing thing. You can explain to somebody in a human rights organization how to do something with like, you know, curated cryptographic key and maybe store it in like a password manager. And at the end of the day, they will revert back to G Drive and some sort of G Suite identity and, you know, or storing this in Chrome, like all these really bad ideas, basically, for security. And so it just goes to show how entrenched all this stuff is. And, and it means that as a community, we've really got to work hard to try to build tools to help overcome some of this friction. Because you could do... You can create a brilliant system, and in the end, if no one trusts that it's going to be secure, or even if they are convinced they don't even use the technology, we don't even get started. I guess the question is also, like, does identity equal credibility to a lot of these people that you're interfacing with? You know, like, is this a credible witness? Is this someone that I can trust in terms of submitting accurate, reliable data to this, to this database? Is that also a challenge in a pseudonymous by design space? Sure, I mean, so we have a framework in which we store information. So it starts with capturing the information, we then store it, and then the final step is that we verify the contents of the information. So in this case you brought up, if an actor is maybe a questionable actor or submitting false information for a misinformation campaign, that in theory would be identified as part of that verification step. Because you could do all the cryptographic proofs in the world, but if it's a deep fake video, it's, it's fake, right? It doesn't matter if it's stored and sealed on something like Filecoin or you know, it's authenticated with a hash or in a you know, cryptographic key. So you know, I think that um, humans are always in the loop. And one of the things that I, I find so fascinating about this is that it, it points to the next step for communities like Filecoin in dealing with things like governance because what it, ultimately what you're getting at is that reputation is an evolving process in establishing, and then it can also be torn down. It could be fair, it could be unfair. And so really what you're gonna find is that governance and creating of communities with shared values, you're gonna root your reputation in that community. Always, actually. Because it provides proper context, and I know that that sounds kind of abstract, and I, I promise you I'm not a political scientist, but what it, what it really means is that 
as, as much as we love this vision of a trustless, math-based system, we actually have to keep humans front and center in our mind. And when you come together as five storage providers and you do a deal to, let's say, store data, you have to know each other. And the bonds that you establish in creating a commercial relationship, a social relationship, et cetera, they mean something. You're forming a de facto community around this. What is this gathering here? It's the same thing. There's a community of people with shared values, and you can't skip that process. Um, and, and I think that you know, blockchain technologies allow for potentially you to automate some of that. It can become more efficient, but also you know, it can be damning. I mean, imagine if someone was to impugn my reputation, and then suddenly that's an immutable record somewhere, and I can't get rid of that, right? Technically verified, but highly dubious. Yeah, and so the only way out of that is that you have to be up front, and we have to together like, have these types of gatherings and talk about how are we going to work together? What are the standards? What are the values? Um, and I'll just give a shout out, if he's still here, to Nathan Schneider, who I, I you know, so admire, because I think that he, in seeing, looking around the corner, in some of our discussions, we started to realize that even defining what values make sense to us, that's, a, that's difficult as well, right? And I think we need to start thinking about that uh, very quickly. All right, let's go back on the ground to Ukraine. So you potentially have a front row seat to, you know, um, the frontiers of dis and misinformation, right? When you're dealing with this record, this evidentiary record, you're obviously seeing a lot of disinformation. What are you seeing? What does that look like to you? Is it the deep fakes that you alluded to, or is it something more simple, but perhaps just as insidious? I still think we're in the realm of shallow fakes. I mean, there was a Zelensky deep fake that was released in, I think, March or April, and it didn't go anywhere. Um, I am concerned about satellite deep fakes. That, that is a thing I'm concerned what is, about. What is that thing? It just is, doesn't know. you have satellite data that's manipulated. I'm concerned about audio deep fakes that are compelling and very difficult to spot by either human or machine um, forensics. I'm also very concerned about what Russia is specifically doing in destroying the methods in which we do forensic analysis. And let me tell you about this, because this is yeah. really crazy. Every week on Russian state TV, there is a television show that is dedicated to taking videos that are shot on the ground in Ukraine and kind of Alex Jones style, systematically going through to show you, hey, you think that's a dead body on the ground? But look here, and they pause the frame. And they create these kind of pseudo forensic CSI-like types of analyses, and they say, look, that hand was moving of that body. That means that's a crisis actor. So this is bonkers because it's not just a misinformation campaign that denies something on the basis of, let's say, a set of alternate facts. It's doing something much deeper, is that it's training people to become these forensic analysts that through their technical knowledge of how things are submitted, how imagery can be manipulated, they are generating conspiracies and doubt. This is a whole nother level of misinformation because it means that we, as, as we do our work, as experts do their work to verify information and try to actually get a clear understanding of whether or not a video is true or not, we, we have people on the other side who are questioning even the ability for us to do our work. Well, you know, with your other hat, the entertainment hat on, you're a storyteller. Uh, I'm curious for your perspective as to why disinforma disinformation is so attractive to be at people in Russia, the US, or places around the world. Is there something sort of like strangely human in our desire to believe some of that manipulation? I mean, I, I don't want to speculate on psychology. It's not really my you area. Don't? But Come I, on now. I'll, you know, I'll, let, me, let me see if I can suggest. I mean, look, um, I think conspiracy theories appeal because they're a tautology. They're a very complete and comprehensive picture of what a reality might be. And if you can present something as a set of interlocking pieces that kind of make sense as a whole, 
could literally be a lie, but it's internally consistent, and therefore it's actually a much easier form of reality because you have a complete worldview and it just matches and now everything kind of fits into that. When of course, like reality is much more complicated. So I think cognitively, conspiracy theories just work because frankly, it just takes less effort to think through it. That's one thing. Well, and, I, and I don't think that's a new, that's a, not a new phenomenon at all. But I'd say in this digital age, we have a different issue altogether, which is that the story of the last 10 years and our experience with Web2 has led us to rightfully question what we're seeing online. 74% of Americans don't believe that what they see online is true, and they have like, good reason to be skeptical, right? But now what's happened is that that skepticism and almost nihilism about the prospects of even seeing anything true online or trusting anything, that's being exploited and what's happened is that the Russians have been at this for a very long time. We were seeing evidence in Syria, as an example, eight, nine years ago, in which they were laying the groundwork for how to basically weaponize doubt. And I'll give you an example. There were cases in Syria where you had bombs with chemical weapons, which was a red line for the Obama administration, dropping on homes where you had children being gassed in their sleep. There were unequivocal photographs and videos of those attacks as first responders came in. It had every sign of being a chemical weapons attack. And yet, before the first bombs dropped, Russian operatives had already put into place hashtags that for hours before the bombs dropped had started to say things like Syria hoax. And by the time that the bombs dropped, that hashtag had made its way to a variety of different influencers the photos come out, the videos come out, it's a hoax. Those are the tactics that have been perfected. This is not new. So you can imagine what's going on in Ukraine. This is now in hyperdrive. And so therefore, I, I think the message that I, I, I would hope that people take away from all of this is that we really need to now double down and think about how we're going to build bonds and restore trust because the adversary that we have on the other side, this is nothing about this is new for them. They've had nearly a decade to perfect. We are behind. So as you hear a lot of people that are questioning, oh, there's no hope, the internet can't possibly fix itself, or the crypto crash is here and we told you that all this stuff is BS and all that. It's like, yes, there are fraud and this, there are problems, but then, but to be complacent, to not think about what our responsibilities are, I'd argue that that's actually far worse. And, and it takes communities like ours to start to say in a very sober way, hey, we're here to build. We're not here to build hype, we're here to build real tools. And, and hopefully that will be the thing that comes out of all of this. That was wonderfully articulated, thank you for that. Um, so that's a huge undertaking, much of it more human than technological. That said, are there any technological tools that you wish that you had at your disposal when it comes to reestablishing trust in what's on the internet? A magic wand? Yeah. <laughs> can, we get, can we get someone on that? Um, such good questions. I actually have to think on these because they don't immediately come to mind because I, I'll, I'll tell you, um, you know, some of the things that I, that I wake up every day and I really wish that we had was not necessarily more tools for d automating processes, um, but it's more tools around communication. And I think one of the things that we're gonna realize is that as a community, that we need to start figuring out efficient ways of being able to communicate things about reputation and efficiency. I mean, a lot of the stuff that goes on, let's say even within this ecosystem, it's Slack-based, and I don't think Anyone here would say that Slack is a good tool. It's like a giant piece of crap. Um, because it's very, it's, it's very cumbersome to actually get proper conversations going there. And I'd say that we really need to work hard on creating new systems to be able to establish best practices. Because I, what I find most of the time is that we just need to do better networking because a lot of the solutions are actually tucked away there. And then we need to document them and make sure that other people can see it. And that, I, I, you know, 
as a lab, we, we are trying to do that, but I think we can do a lot more of it. So I think community-driven projects that focus on best practices, that develop tools um, for documentation and standards around documentation, I know this is like the most boring possible thing I could have wished for. You gave me anything in the world, but that's what I wish because I think that there's a lot of talent and intelligence that's already out there, and we just don't know where it is. You mentioned that you're easily distractible. Is that potentially a field in which you might find yourself distracted towards soon? Is that, is that, the, next, is that the next project? No, I, I, I really hope that I can just go back to using a rotary telephone and get my work done every day. So. Got it, got it. Feel you on that. All right, well, let's wrap this thing up. One last question for you. Um, again, obviously a man of many skills and talents. Give me an alpha leak here. You're sort of interestingly riding the culture around technology, around entertainment. Where do you see both those things moving over, I don't know, the next two, three years? Be that in crypto during this bear market where the biddling does occur, or be it elsewhere in the broader world that is interesting to you personally? You know, it's interesting, um, when I think about, from an entertainment perspective, let's start there. Um, if you look at the innovation that happened with something like Netflix as an example, probably the most profound impact that it had was that it changed viewing habits because with the arrival of binge watching, it actually changed story. So I know as like working as a writer on Silicon Valley, we had the luxury of knowing that there was at least a week's delay in which people would be seeing this and so we could pace our episodes knowing that there's some time and that it wasn't something that we necessarily optimized it for binging. Although you could binge it, I guess. It would be pretty painful, I think. In any event, that's an emergent property, right? Netflix says we have a platform, we have some opportunities, and then the storytellers go, well, if you're going to show all of the content all at once, then we're going to actually change the content so that that can be a thing, right? That can be enjoyable. I think Web3 has also a potential of changing content as well because as things become more participatory, you have stakeholders that can be involved in things, I actually think we're going to see a dramatic transformation of storytelling again. And what might that look like? I think one, that content specifically around human interest stories, social impact, I think we're gonna see a dramatic change. You're gonna watch something which just gets your heart going and you're saying, I wanna make a difference. You will own a piece of that content. You will help finance the next investigation. You will help contribute to some form of donation which can make an impact. You might also join, you might also govern. I, I firmly believe that every documentary which can illuminate something or a news story that can illuminate something will, with tokens and various distributed technologies, move from being just a descriptive platform to being an impact platform. I have no question in my mind that's going to happen. I think, similarly, as we think about the opportunities to look at fact-based reporting around climate and larger scientific opportunities, that, will, that type of content will change. I think things will become a lot more active. And finally, um, with respect to art and music and all of that, you know, I think that most musicians, most filmmakers, celebrities, et cetera, they care about the communities that they create and also don't just want them to be, yes, it's about fun and all that, but I think they also want to have an impact in the real world as well. So I do see a world where as you start to see new economic incentives come forward, I think people are going to reinvest those things and I think we're looking at the next generation of charity, philanthropy, social development, social impact, activism, et cetera. I think it's gonna look like nothing we've ever seen before because it will have far greater and deeper engagement that will sustain and it will last because of those incentives, not be eroded by them. Jonathan. Thank you for that discussion. It was really fascinating. I really enjoyed it. Um, hope you did too. We're going to leave it there. Uh, this was wonderful. Thank you again. And I'm going to call up Aaron to get us on our way. So, thanks. Here, here. Thank you.